Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. We will continue our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In the previous video, we talked about the characteristics of Corynebacterium diphtheriae, the gram-positive pleomorphic rod that causes the disease known as diphtheria. We have two types of diphtheria. We have respiratory diphtheria and we have cutaneous diphtheria. Respiratory diphtheria includes the infamous pseudomembranous pharyngitis, the thick grayish pseudomembrane that's adherent to your tonsils. And if you try to remove it, it's not going to be removed. If you force it, it's going to bleed. This is unique for diphtheria. As for cutaneous diphtheria, it starts with a papule and then it becomes chronic non-healing ulcer, sometimes covered with another gray membrane. Complications include myocarditis and peripheral neuropathy. With that said, now let's get started. I can just delve into the lecture, but I want to give you what's different, what's unique to diphtheria. It's the grayish necrotic membrane that's firmly adherent to the following tonsils, palate, uvula, and nasopharynx. It's very difficult to remove this membrane in the beginning. If you force it, if you try to remove it forcibly, the tissue will bleed. This is peculiar and unique to diphtheria. When you see this on your exam question, the answer is diphtheria. Take it to the bank. But hey, metacosis, why do we call it pseudomembrane? What's the difference between pseudomembrane and a real, true membrane? Big difference. A true membrane is the membrane that you have in every one of your cells. It's the classic lipid bilayer membrane, phospholipid to be specific, and some proteins and some carbohydrates. However, a pseudomembrane is a membrane that does not exist physiologically, unlike the true membrane. Pseudomembrane is a pathology, not physiology. A bunch of necrotic dead cells, plus bacterial cells, plus inflammatory cells, plus fibrin. This is the grayish, thick, ugly, adherent pseudomembrane, unlike the beautimous true membrane that all of us have. We have two famous pseudomembranes, pseudomembranous pharyngitis caused by Corynebacterium diphtheria, and pseudomembranous colitis caused by Clostridium difficile. Please, please watch the videos in this playlist in order. Corynebacterium diphtheria is an immotile, aerobic, non-spore-forming, gram-positive rod. The word coryne means club-shaped. Corynebacterium diphtheria has mycolic acid, but it's the short-chain mycolic acid, and that's why Corynebacterium diphtheria is not acid-fast. Contrast that with Mycobacterium tuberculosis, long chain mycolic acid, therefore they are acid fast. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Speaking of tuberculosis, I have a dedicated video on this topic in my pulmonology playlist. Corynebacteria, gram positive pleomorphic rods, non spore forming, aerobic or facultative anaerobes, immotile, catalase positive, they ferment carbohydrates and they produce lactic acid. Corynebacterium diphtheria, four biotypes, the most clinically significant is mitis, the mite mitis. Corynebacterium diphtheria is very irregular, pleomorphic, different shapes, always changing, irregular staining, granules with different colors, not the same colors, different colors, everything is different, everything is becoming, everything is changing, club-shaped, small zone of hemolysis, and they grow on telluride agar, this is how you culture them. Hey, metacosis, what would I see under the microscope? You will see gram-positive pleomorphic rods, they look like a club, and you might find metachromatic granules on the club if you use aniline stain. If this is a club and that's a club and that's a club and here's another club, they will arrange themselves resembling Chinese letters. Diphtheria toxin is an exotoxin, i.e. the toxin is released from the bacterial cell once the bacteria invades your body. The bacteria could invade your nasopharynx or could invade your skin, causing respiratory diphtheria or cutaneous diphtheria respectively. And that's why the site of the infection makes a difference. The exotoxin of diphtheria is a classic AB toxin. A is active, it has the catalytic enzyme activity, it's very toxic. B is for binding, it facilitates the entry of the A subunit into your cell. 
The mechanism of action or the pathophysiology of the diphtheria toxin was discussed in the previous video. Remember the tox gene, the tox protein, the two subunits bound by disulfide bond, the three regions and the inhibition of elongation factor 2 which inhibits your own protein synthesis. And without protein synthesis, you have no enzymes, no receptors, no pumps, no carriers, no channels, i.e. your toast. The receptor for the diphtheria toxin is present on your heart cells and your nerve cells. That's why diphtheria can lead to myocarditis and neuropathy. I've told you, it makes sense if you stop and think. Risk factors for diphtheria infection, lack of immunization, living or traveling to an endemic area, being immunocompromised and being exposed to a high virulent strain of diphtheria. If you are immunized, if diphtheria affects you, it's gonna be an asymptomatic state. Very, very, very few symptoms or no symptoms whatsoever. We'll call you an asymptomatic carriage or carrier because you can carry diphtheria to another person who is not immunized. If you're not immunized, you risk having a severe diphtherial disease. It could be fulminant or fatal. Oh, by the way, humans are the only known reservoir for diphtheria. The clinical picture, i.e. signs and symptoms of diphtheria depends on these four risk factors and the site of infection. Why medicosis? Because the diphtheria toxin is produced at the site of infection, causing respiratory symptoms, cutaneous symptoms, depending on the site of entry. This toxin can spread to the bloodstream, causing systemic signs and symptoms. When you have toxin in your blood, this is called toxemia. Not to be confused with having bacteria in the blood, hashtag bacteremia. They are not the same. Let's start by talking about respiratory diphtheria, and then we'll talk about cutaneous diphtheria. Respiratory diphtheria. The diphtheria will enter to a respiratory tract, and then give it two to four days, the incubation period, you will start having symptoms. Why? The bacteria is dividing like crazy in your epithelium of the pharynx and surrounding soft tissue, giving you symptoms that include low-grade fever, malaise, sore throat, and the nasty, ugly, infamous pseudomembrane on your pharynx. Not just the nasopharynx, we have the uvula, palate, tonsils as well. The membrane can span all of them. It is grayish and thick and very difficult to remove. If you force it, it's gonna bleed. This is unique. This membrane is made of necrotic cells, bacterial cells, inflammatory cells, and fibrin. When the toxin spreads to the blood, you get systemic signs and symptoms, myocarditis and neuritis. Tell me about the myocarditis. It starts one to two weeks from the onset of symptoms. The myocarditis gets worse as the pharyngeal symptoms are improving. So your pharyngeal symptoms are getting better, but your myocarditis is starting and getting worse. After myocarditis, of course, I'm affecting the muscles of the heart. The muscles of the heart can fail, heart failure. The muscles of the heart cannot conduct well, arrhythmia. It makes perfect sense. As for neuropathy, we have neuropathy at the pharynx and palate. Then they involve the oculomotor nerve, causing ciliary muscle paralysis. And then you have peripheral neuritis. But hey, medicosis, tell me, what's the fate of the pseudomembrane? Give it a week or so, and you will dislodge it and expectorate it <coughs> on your own. Number two, cutaneous diphtheria. Skin contact with an infected patient will lead to the entry of the ugly. Corinebacterium diphtheria through breaks of your skin. It starts as a papule, then develops into a chronic, non healing ulcer, sometimes covered by grayish membrane. Is this a true membrane? No, this is pseudo membrane. How can we diagnose diphtheria? We'll talk about it in more details in the next video, but in brief. Clinically, is more important than labs. Just by observing signs and symptoms, you can say, I think the patient has diphtheria and you should start treatment immediately. Lab-wise, microscopy, the metachromatic granules, the pleomorphic rods that look like a club arranged in Chinese letters. You can culture diphtheria using cysteine telluride agar and you can use the ELEC test to look for the diphtheria toxin. Treatment-wise, penicillin or erythromycin, these are antibiotics, they are not antitoxins. They will destroy the bacteria and therefore decrease the production of the exotoxin. Try to neutralize the toxin, prophylaxis, the vaccine, and the booster.
It is very effective. Just look at the statistics of diphtheria between the 1920s and today in countries with high rates of vaccination. Carinibacterium diphtheria is a gram-positive rod, non-spore-forming, immotile, Chinese letters. It secretes exotoxin. The tox gene was introduced into the bacteria via lysogeny, grows on tellurite agar, use aniline dye to see the metachromatic granule. The beta-prophage is also what introduced the tox gene into the bacterial cell. Signs and symptoms, we have uh, pseudomembranous pharyngitis with lymphadenopathy, we have myocarditis and neuropathy. Treatment is erythromycin. Now let's review Corinebacterium diphtheria from Picmonic. It's a great website with hundreds of pictured mnemonics. Corinebacterium diphtheria is a gram positive. Here is my angel. It's a rod. Here is a rod. It releases an exotoxin. Here is the exotoxin leaving the balloon or leaving the bacterial cell. It was introduced by beta prophage by lysogeny. Grows on telluride agar. Here is the telephone. Don't forget my metachromatic granules using an aniline dye. Aliens. Diseases include pseudomembranous pharyngitis. Here is the pseudomembra pharaoh. Pseudomembranous pharyngitis. Lymph adenopathy. Here are swollen lymph nodes. Myocarditis. Here is the mayo. And peripheral neuropathy. Here is the parrot with inflamed neurons. If you want to learn more about penicillin and erythromycin, download my antibiotics course. It comes with 40 videos, plus notes, plus questions and cases, and my Perfectionist Ultimate Notebook and a mind map to help you memorize these antibiotics. All of these are downloadable at medicosisperfectionist.com. You can also try my new surgery high yields course, as well as my emergency medicine high yields course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.